afternoon, everyone. Uh, as mentioned, I'm going to spoke, speak about concurrency and parallelism. We're in PyCon 2019. Uh, a bit of the talk, about the talk. So who am I? Uh, I'm Guy Dolberg. I have a 15-year development experience and in Python only three years, only in the company that I work at now. Uh, I work today for a company called Satellogic. Uh, we build satellites, we build the uh, constellation of satellites. Uh, it's not really relevant for what we are going to talk about. The only thing is that what you're going to see here, uh, it's based on the experience that I have to support a big magnitude of data that we're collecting that look like this. This is our data. This is a, an image that taken from one of our satellites. Uh, what I'm going to talk about, uh, why I'm going to talk about, uh, doing, why I'm doing this talk, so first of all, I think it's important knowledge that every uh, Python developer should have. Uh, I think that I would have been happy to have this uh, uh, talk about two years ago when I started working with concurrency and parallelism in Python. And it's fun. I encourage you to do talks. Uh, it's very, I like it very much. I encourage you. Uh, what am I going to talk about? Uh, we are going to see what is concurrency and parallelism, but more importantly, we're going to see some practical ways of implementing uh, concurrency and uh, parallelism in uh, Python. And if time lets us, I, ho I really hope so, you will see how to run uh, your code in, con in a parallel in a, a cluster. Uh, the example that you are going to see are made up synthesizers to this talk. They're very simple. Uh, you will see what I mean. So which Python? 3.7. Okay, the resources, the slides, you can find these slides uh, on my GitHub pages. Uh, the QR code is for the slide, so if you have internet access, you can uh, see that I didn't skip any slide, or if I'm skipping any slide, you could uh, look at them later. Okay? Okay, so now we need some theoretical background. What is concurrency? Okay, so concurrency is when you want to run two tasks at the same time. Okay, you want to execute them at the same time. You can run them at the same time. That is concurrency. Parallelism is when they are run in parallel. They run in two execution paths the picture is much more understandable. In the first line, we have only one Coke vendor machine. On the second, we have two lines with two vendor machines. So the second image, they are running in parallel. The first image, they are only concurrently running. Okay, next theoretical subject that we need to be aware of is the IO bound versus CPU bound. Whenever we want to apply, uh, to make optimization on a code, we need to identify our bottleneck. And our bottleneck can be IO bound and it can be CPU bound. If your program can run faster when you're using computing units, more computing units, your program is considered to be CPU bound. Means that applying CPU bound technique will help you. If your program can run faster when using more bandwidth or reading or writing to from several sources, your program considered to be IO bounded. It is important to identify the nature of your program because adding more computing units to IO bounded program will not help. And running CPU bounded programs using a single CPU is suboptimal. And there are also memory bounded problems. Same criteria, if you run, if you're adding more memory to your program will make it run faster, your memory bounded. To work with this unit cluster, uh, I really hope that we'll have time for that. Okay, so let's start with uh, IO bounded tasks. Okay, basically when dealing with IO bounded tasks, I would like to break the code that is bounded by IO and run it concurrently. Okay, but remember physics, in a single machine you cannot utilize more than your available disk I.O. 
in a single machine you cannot utilize more than your available network. And in the client-server architecture, if your client is running concurrently, concurrently but your server cannot uh, accept more than that, then you didn't do a lot. So let's start with code. In order to simulate my points, in order to show you what I want to do, I created a simple program in Flask uh, that slips. Slips for two seconds, that's all it does. I'm running it with Gunicorn because I wanted to control the number of requests uh, that uh, it can handle. So if you read it, what you'll understand that I have a Flask uh, program that slips for 10 seconds and I have 10 requests. Okay, naive, naive implementation will be sequential. In a sequential, I have a request. You're going to see this pattern uh, repeating itself. I use time to measure the, what I wanted to measure. So we have here this uh, very simple code, sequential, and run it in a sequential way. Do the request one by another as a sequence. And the execution time as expected is 20 seconds. Okay, now I want to use concurrently, and in order to use concurrently, I'm going to use thread pool executor. There are other ways to do it, but I chose to use thread pool executor. I also imported as completed because it helps me to iterate over the completed task. You will see it, it makes it much easier. Okay, let's continue. Uh, I identified what is the problem that I tried to solve, what is the task that I want to do concurrently, which is getting uh, 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 the text out of the request. And now I'm going to submit this code 10 times. Afterward, the thread pool will execute the code concurrently, and uh, my code will wait for all the execution to finish, using the as complete. Okay, so that is what is going on here. Again, I start the, my uh, time ticker. Uh, I create a thread pool executor as a context. Uh, for me, it was easier to do it. Again, you can run uh, threads in different ways. And uh, here I submit that, if you can see the IO bounded task, that's where I submit it with the, var with the argument hosts, which is the, the same host for everyone. Uh, and that's as expected, is running in concurrently, not in parallel, concurrently. And the total time of execution is two uh, seconds. What happens, what happens when we reach the limit? Okay, so we can reach the limit for many reasons. We can reach the limit because our uh, traffic is uh, beyond what our CP gives us. The traffic can uh, be... <clears throat> The server is much more, uh, cannot handle more the requests that we're sending it. So one way we could do it is to throttle. Throttle is not to overload the server. If you remember the code that I saw you in the beginning, I'm throttling inside the, uh, my server only for 10 uh, requests. I allow only 10 requests. So what happens to the other requests? They're going to a queue and they are being, uh, uh, being responded uh, responded later. So if I run this code, and the only difference in this code is that now I have 20 uh, uh, requests, uh, it runs for four seconds. Again, I hope that you are, it is expectable also, also for you. A way, if I want to bring the uh, power, the control to the client side, I can define the number of workers that I want to work with. This is why I like to work with Thread Pool Executor, because I can say what is the maximum, uh, maximum workers. And now I'm not, uh, it's not that the server is blocking me, it's not that the server is throttling me. Now uh, I'm the owner of this uh, throttling. I can decide if I want it to be four uh, workers, 10 workers, how, what is my concurrency level? This is why I like it better. This is why I have this slide, because I want to show you that uh, uh, why I love, uh, think that using thread pool executor uh, is good. OK, async IO. If we're talking about, uh, risk, uh, <clears throat> if we're talking about uh, uh, IO bounded tasks, so we must also talk about async IO. It was mentioned today as well. It's a way of running. It's a way of running, uh, uh, of, of using a single thread, but this single thread uh, 
deals the concurrency for you. You give it a special a method that we'll see in a special method that we'll see in a moment. It can uh, run uh, each of the line of the, uh, of the methods on its thread, and it can go out to different threads. So for example, if you're going to wait for a, for a, to get a response from a server, for example, for a server that you saw there, uh, it can uh, decide to uh, delegate this to a different uh, thread. And by that, we are getting the uh, uh, concurrency. So as I said, there is a special, first of all, we need to import async IO, and also I'm importing IO HTTP, which is uh, our library, which is designed to work in async IO. Uh, so as I said, there are special methods that uh, the main thread, the main loop, knows uh, where uh, that it can uh, run each of them in the exit and uh, suspend each of the execution there. This one is called quarantine, coroutine. And you defined it with the special keyword async. You see async is uh, spread around all, all uh, around this method. It means that uh, it, it makes sense only in the async IO, uh, only in the ICK IO uh, library. It doesn't make sense anywhere else. And it tells the, uh, again, the, the, the event loop that it can exit and enter each uh, line of the code here. So for example, in the first line, not in the definition, it can wait until it gets back a client session, and only when it gets back the client session, the, thread, the main thread will run uh, the code that it uh, follows. And the wait is a way to wait for uh, the responses. For example, in this case, we are waiting for all the gathers, sorry, for all the quarantines that you saw before, 10 of them, to return. When they return, we return as well. Again, it's a quarantine by itself, what you see it's here. So it's a long story to say that uh, if you must have an event loop. You cannot run it if you don't have event loop. In this example, I'm using Jupyter Notebook. Jupyter Notebook runs on, uh, on, the, on its own event loop, so I didn't have to start. But there's a way to start event loops. And uh, now we can run the code. Uh, and the only thing that we need to do is await the quarantine, the main quarantine that you saw before. And that's it. Now it runs in a concurrently. The main difference between what I showed you before with the thread pool and this is who controls when we are going to concurrent. What is the, what is the uh, process, the sequential process? Here, who this, uh, uh, the event loop decides, the main thread decides what he wants to do concurrently and when he wants to do it. And in the other uh, example, in the first example, I decided that this uh, code will run on a different thread. Uh, which model to choose? I think it's a matter of taste. Uh, okay, let's move on to CPU bounded uh, jobs. So, uh, for the purpose of the talk, I'm going to produce a big area of random floats. Okay, so we have, uh, I used NumPy. The reason that I use NumPy is because it's much faster. Try to run it with random of, uh, of uh, uh, Python, it will take a long time. Uh, you, there is also another point about NumPy that you will see by the end of this talk. Okay, let's try to get the maximal value out of this array. The first attempt is sequential approach, and that's just using max. And that took me, took me 16 uh, seconds. Uh, the CPU utilization, this is a picture of my edge top. You could see that I have four CPUs and you could see that only one CPU was working. Okay, now let's try to use threads. We saw threads from before, we know the theory. Thread uses, uh, we use the p threads of uh, C++, it should work. Uh, so first we need to, the, the proposed solution that I'm going to have here is to split the list to chunks, find the maximum value in each chunk, find the maximum value in all the maximum values. So this is how I propose to find uh, the maximum value of each chunk. So I slice the chunk by the chunk number. 
And cutting long story short, the execution time here is uh, 0 0.16. The number of chunks is 100. So it seems like a good choice of, uh, look, looks like a good approach. Uh, we should, it should take us about five seconds to do this thing, according to the theory. So let's try. Okay, and it took us 16 seconds. Okay, so the reason, for me, that was a surprise. I didn't know about this. Well, of course, for this talk, I knew about it. But before, the first time that I under, uh, encountered this, I was uh, uh, surprised. We say hello to the GIL, the Global Interpreter Lock. The Global Interpreter Lock. In, in general, the con uh, this GIL is to protect us. This GIL is a lock on, uh, across all uh, the members of uh, Python that uh, makes sure that there are not uh, sequential writes uh, and reads for these uh, uh, data members. The problem with this uh, lock, that although it, the, my code run on different threads, the threads need to be synchronized because of the lock, they, need, they are synchronized. And in effect, my code runs uh, sequentially on different CPUs, but sequentially. And uh, as you can see, none of my CPU really was really working during this. Okay, so let's try the same thing with processes. The nice thing about thread pool executor is that it can be easily replaced with process pool executor. The only thing that I need to, ex to change is the executor itself. <coughs> Okay, so it's the same code as you saw before. And now, except for the process pool executor, and now it runs for uh, eight seconds. So also I had an uh, image that shows uh, my CPU. You could have seen my four CPUs working. Uh, but it should have taken us five seconds. So why it's taking us eight seconds? Well, the reason is that spawning processes is in a heavy task. And the other thing is, I don't know if you noticed, I was sent in as a, as a variable, as an argument, I was sending there the chunk itself. And the marshalling and unmarshalling of the chunk data is a heavy task as well. Uh, behind the scene, it's uh, using pickle. So it's not a very, f something that you would like to do. So here I'm going to show you a way that you can solve it. It's also something that we used. Not a, not, not this library, which is shared uh, array by this concept. So shared array is a way to share data, share array between processes. So the first thing you need to do in order to share the data is to create the data. So here is how we create it. And now each of the processes can actually be referred with a, a pointer. So look what I sent now. I sent the chunk num as before, the array key, which is the pointer to the place that we need, and the num of chunk. So everything is the same except for the array key. And in the second line, we're just attaching to that, uh, um, to that array. So uh, again, it looks much of the same. And this time, we're getting closer, 6.65. I will, not, I will not try to improve it any further, but uh, I could spawn uh, the processes before. I could do something like this, but this is where I got. And my CPU utilization, that's what I want to show you before. Four CPUs are working heavily. Now let's check because I, okay. Now let's check what happens when running with NumPy. Do you think? You know what, what, you, what you're going to see now? Uh, so NumPy is doing better. Now, I don't know exactly why they are running much better than me. I didn't look at their source code. But remember that NumPy is uh, compiled and implemented in C. So they don't have the GIL. They can run on many processes that they, they want. And they are doing, uh, um, uh, I think they're good in doing their good stuff. Uh, I don't know exactly what. But the main reason that I put here this slide is to tell you that you should use native libraries, C++, such as NumPy and Pandas, whenever you can, 
to do this kind of thing because that, that's their best of practice. Don't try to invent what they are, uh, uh, what they are good at. And also, they don't have the obligation, they don't have the problem of the, um, the problem of the GIL. So, I will jump fast to Dask. Uh, Dask is a very big uh, uh, library, quite new. I will touch only the part of the Dask that, it's resp uh, that is related to distributed, but it has a lot of other stuff there. I encourage you to look at it. But I'm going to, ta to talk about the, uh, only about uh, Dask Distributed. The reason that I'm going to show you here, here, it here, because it allows you to parallelize our computing, our uh, tasks across several machines, across several hosts, using the same uh, technique on, uh, on, uh, the sa uh, when you're running on the same machine. So first of all, we need to set up the cluster. So setting up a cluster is easy as that. That set up a cluster, a local cluster on my machine. If you want a cluster which is distributed, follow the tutorial. But except for this code, for this setup, everything else will be the same. And then we do the same thing that I said before, split two chunks, find the maximum value of all the chunks. So this is the method that we want to do. Again, I'm using here, because I didn't have a lot of time, uh, in the talk, I'm using here the shared array. Obviously, you cannot use the shared array when you're in a cluster because you're not sharing the same machine. And uh, then finding the maximum value takes seven seconds. The reason that, I sh again, it has the same idea. You see here the map. The map is uh, like, it, it, like the submit, not the submit. The map is like uh, you saw before, the submit you saw before. And here I created a graph. Look at it later because I don't have enough time for it. The main difference is that the uh, blocking method is the result. Until, you, until I did the print, nothing was blocked. I could have ended the, the, the execution. But um, the reason it blocks is because of the print, because of the result. <laughs> And the CPU utilization, again, we're using the, uh, all the CPUs that I have. That's what I wanted. And thank you. And, and now questions. Oh, so the question was, uh, what about the standard library of multi-threading? Uh, uh, I didn't show it, but uh, you can apply it as well. I didn't use it uh, so much. I, for me, the moment that I found out the thread uh, pull executor that I think is uh, based on that, uh, I, I didn't see a reason why not to continue using it, but I don't know. Okay, thank you.